here is Jose. He is the lead of the NASA International Space Station SPHERES and ASTRO-B program. The SPHERES facility is one of the most used and popular ISS national labs with over 80 onboard test sessions and 400 plus hours of on-orbit activities to date. Jose has a bachelor's and a master's in electrical engineering from Arizona State University. Please help me welcome Jose. Thank you very much. It's my privilege to be here and share with you some really exciting work I get to uh, work on at NASA Ames. Uh, as mentioned, I lead a small team uh, at NASA Ames that uh, helps support these spheres in Astrobe facility. Uh, to be more accurate, we're, we're the team that keeps uh, that platform operating on the space station and supporting research that occurs on, on this platform uh, for, for uh, several years now. Uh, in operation for over 10 years on the space station. And then uh, what I'm here today, and it's actually appropriate that it's uh, five years after uh, Mark Masiri's talk, he uh, led this uh, effort um, before I did, and uh, I'm here to present what we've been doing since then. Uh, also to uh, recover some, some of the uh, work done uh, in the past as well, including his work. So you'll, you'll actually see his face in, in this presentation as well. Um, so that's, that's very appropriate and uh, really excited to share this work with you today. So in this talk, I will cover the uh, origin story of how we got started, uh, first with uh, some initial free flowers that NASA's worked on in the past, starting in the late 90s, um, even earlier than that, and then spheres as the uh, uh, platform that ended up, uh, ended up outlasting a lot of other uh, free flowers to operate on the space station. Um, so some of the really cool work we've done with that over the 10 years it's been in operation on Space Station. Um, certainly the free flyer that, uh, that could. And, um, and then get into, uh, well, why are we looking at free flying space robots? Uh, no question about it, that, that sounds cool, right? But uh, there's a lot of really good reasons for uh, doing that. Um, and then uh, going into the next generation of free flying space robots that we're now working on at NASA Ames uh, to be delivered to Space Station early next year. Um, so some really exciting capabilities uh, coming online. Uh, and then our guest scientist program where uh, we have uh, some processes set up to enable guest researchers from academia, private industry, uh, commercial industry, uh, uh, universities, companies uh, all over the world, not just US, but all over the world to use this platform on the space station to do some really cool research and to enable uh, future uh, autonomy on, uh, in space. And then I'm just going to touch on some uh, future free flowering research that we're looking at. Uh, we're already working with people who have ideas for how to use Astro-B on the space station. Uh, and then touch on uh, STEM outreach, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, that's a big part of what we do with these free flyers. Um, and some exciting work that we've been doing with Spheres and now uh, continuing with uh, astro -B. Free flyers for Spheres got started, in the, like I said, in the late 90s, originally with this uh, first project called uh, the um, PSA, uh, an adjustable autonomy spacecraft free flying robot. So as you can tell, it looks very sleek, very capable, and it was a great project. Uh, they did a lot of work in the, this field. Um, and let me jump straight to a video here. Uh, this is one of the early prototypes uh, on display at Ames. Um, certainly it looks a lot like a, a certain uh, droid from, from uh, Star Wars. Uh, certainly we get a lot of inspiration from science fiction. As, uh, as I'll get to as well, um, here's a, a rendering of uh, the real thing in a mock-up of what uh, PSI, PSA looked like. Um, personal satellite assistant is what PSA stood for. Um, and some really cool video that I was able to dig up about its operation in our microgravity test facility. This is a lab we have at Ames that uh, it's basically the world's greatest crane game. I tell you, because I've, I've worked with this. And uh, it's this gantry in a room uh, set up to simulate what you might see on the space station. And this gantry allows this free flower to move in a full six degree of freedom motion across the module uh, in much the way it would uh, in space. So the gantry is canceling out the gravity um, and allowing this to move under its own propulsion um, and navigate across this mock-up of the space station. You can tell this uh, back in the late 90s, they were looking at vision-based navigation, a lot of fiducials on the screen there. Um, and then this uh, uh, rendering of what the um, PSA model looked like. 
thought this was some uh, really cool video to share. Uh, late 90s through 2003, I want to say this, this project uh, was going. Um, but ultimately did not end up on space station. This project got canceled early. Um, but uh, they certainly made a lot of advances. Cer certainly looking at becoming an assistant to crew, right? Back then they were working with uh, PDAs, right? And uh, how do you provide the functionality of a PDA to an astronaut on a space station? So they were looking at vision-based navigation, um, scheduling, uh, uh, identifying uh, faults and anomalies on space station and notifying crew. So all kinds of really cool functionality that you'd want out of a free-flying space robot on, on the space station. But unfortunately, that did not get uh, continued. Uh, here's another free-flying project that operated in the late 90s. Uh, the video here you're seeing is of AirCam, uh, led out of a group at JSC that did an actual EVA free-flying uh, experiment outside the uh, space shuttle in 1997. Um, and so they were successful in getting a lot of flight time uh, with that, or at least a limited amount of flight time. Um, and as opposed to PSA or Spheres or now Astrobe, uh, AirCam was designed to operate outside uh, as on its own uh, in an EVA, ex external vehicle activity, versus IVA, internal vehicle uh, activity. So again, a lot of advances there, but ultimately that did not continue. Really cool picture of PSA, uh, or I'm sorry, AirCam operating outside the space shuttle. Uh, together with crew, there were two people um, operating outside the space shuttle there. Another video of uh, AirCam doing some uh, navigation there. It was fully uh, um, remote controlled from a crew member inside the space station looking out the window. You'll, you can tell from some of this video there were some uh, colored markers outside uh, AirCam and that was actually how the astronauts uh, identified its motion as it rotated, right? They, they're handling a joystick and trying to control from inside the space shuttle uh, its uh, uh, pan, tilt, rotation and so forth using those indicators. Uh, painted onto uh, AirCam. And so along, com along comes uh, Spheres, which was a, a student-built project. Ultimately, a very small team of students and uh, researchers at MIT funded by DARPA to look at uh, in-space um, satellite work and building a facility where you can do uh, some risk-tolerant research uh, in space. And uh, it's this scrappy little project that could and ultimately uh, went on to operate for over 10 years on the space station. Um, uh, installed in 2006, first operated, um, and then transitioned to NASA Ames in 2010 to be operated as a facility. So first operated by MIT um, under DARPA funding, um, it was decided that uh, NASA operated uh, as a full-fledged full facility on the space station, offering its use to researchers all over the country and all over the world. Um, and again, one of the big benefits of this kind of facility inside the space station is it's very risk tolerant. You can do uh, advanced uh, research and uh, testing rapid iteration type work in an environment where you can afford to fail. You can afford uh, different bugs, for example. Put up a new algorithm, run into a bug, and uh, we can just call up to the astronaut and say, hey, push the reset button and try again. Uh, that's not something you can do with a dedicated space system or satellite operating. Uh, all by itself. So it provides us a very comfortable lab to operate in. You can think of ISS as an orbiting lab, uh, except it's in, in space, right? Uh, where you can do experiments, iteration, uh, and very fast uh, development. And I would argue that's one of the big reasons for its success over the last 10 years. We're one of the most operated facilities on the space station. Uh, as mentioned earlier, over 80, uh, 100, we're closing in on 100 test sessions operating on the space station, over 600 hours of crew time uh, spent on, on space station operating all kinds of research. And I'm going to cover some of that research done over the 10 years. Um, and I would argue one reason for that is uh, a rapid iteration, pushing the boundaries of what NASA can do on the space station. As you can imagine, uh, NASA has, has in the past had this mindset of failure is not an option, right? We've, we've uh, learned some hard lessons in that regard, and certainly with regards to crew safety, that's very important. But uh, together with the ISS program, we've transitioned into this idea where we can do rapid iteration uh, and high-risk type uh, research on, on space station, at least in regards to uh, mission success. Here's that small team out of MIT doing some uh, vomit comet testing. 
with uh, MIT. And uh, here is a picture of spheres uh, on the ground. This is uh, affectionately referred to as blue. Uh, there are three in operation on the space station, three in op uh, at least three in operation on the ground that can uh, simulate uh, exactly what we do up on, on space station. Uh, spheres is operated by uh, CO2, compressed CO2 tanks, uh, a lot like the paintball guns. If you've ever gone paintballing, you put in a tank, uh, little solenoids open up, and there are 12 different thrusters that give you full holonomic motion uh, across the space station, uh, very much like the, that droid on space station, uh, or droid in Star Wars, I should refer to. As the origin story for Spheres goes, uh, there was that MIT professor that uh, challenged his senior design team uh, by showing them that very clip out of Star Wars from uh, uh, where you see the, the trainer droid, right, shooting lasers at Luke Skywalker, and he challenged them to build that exact thing, and, and that's what they went on and, and uh, did. Little, some cool pictures of what's inside, uh, very jam-packed, uh, about the size of a volleyball. Uh, Spheres is full of the avionics, and it's a fully enclosed satellite system, and that's what they initially set out to build, was a satellite-like spacecraft where they can test out uh, satellite algorithms, formation flight, um, in space uh, construction, automated docking, all kinds of really cool research. And here's some video showing uh, their operation on the space station. This is from one of the earlier uh, test sessions. Uh, and this video is sped up four times, so they don't actually move around this fast. Uh, but it gives you an idea for how uh, they move around up, up uh, in space station and just the type of maneuvers they're capable of doing. Uh, it's, it's no wonder that uh, this is one of the favorite payloads for the astronauts to be working on. Uh, they, they certainly do their share of uh, maintenance and, and uh, uh, other science, but these things are all out toys that they get to pull out. And in fact, uh, in one uh, occurrence, uh, an astronaut's requested to use these uh, spheres on his weekend time. Uh, astronauts do get uh, free time on the weekends, and uh, he was so enthralled with using these uh, spheres, uh, um, uh, free flyers, that he wanted to pull them out on a weekend and look at some uh, interesting research on how these things can be useful for crew uh, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, with uh, Mike Hopkins, I believe it was, uh, on the space station. And so uh, certainly a favorite payload on, on space station. And uh, as I said, in over 10 years, we've done a lot of really cool research um, on space station in both foundational uh, fundamental research and. Uh, uh, the move, movement of slosh, and let me just jump into some of these right away. But this slide kind of gives you an outline of uh, where a PSA, um, air cam, uh, spheres over 10 years, and now Astrobe is going to take over um, next year in 2018, and how they can uh, feed into a lot of the technology areas that NASA has identified as being important for advancing space technology and exploration. We made this special from so National you, Geographic. Walk me through what you're working on in this lab. Yeah, this is an experiment called Spheres. Uh, and these uh, satellite robots are specifically designed to function in the microgravity. They contain the software that the scientists are testing. And eventually, these will be used to create the robots that can go outside of the space station and perform inspection, uh, repair, and other tasks in space. The uh, only payload during that entire hour uh, to be operated live uh, for that special is a full uh, hour-long special National Geographic did where they were interviewing crew and going through the day in the life of crew and certainly uh, doing a lot of education on what we do on the space station, the vast amount of research that gets done on the space station. And we were fortunate enough to be uh, operated uh, live during that uh, tape, uh, not taping, but uh, streamed live to the public. Um, and, and, uh, and we were actually left operating for a uh, good several minutes after that as he went on talking about other, other research and we kept operating in the background and it made for some uh, great backdrop uh, to that uh, special. Rings was uh, an interesting investigation uh, where they looked at uh, electromagnetic um, formation flight where they're trying to figure out can you navigate free flowers using just electricity electromagnetic formation flight where you're trying to control the distance between two objects using big rings generating an electromagnetic field. And certainly one of the concepts they're looking at for uh, wide aperture um, type telescopes where you want to keep a lot of different things uh, in synchronous operation in, in orbit uh, without using fuel. 
And so this is uh, uh, one way to, one approach to that. Uh, in addition, they were looking at wireless power transfer um, and trying to transfer power from one item to the other. And this is another example of where we set out to do one thing um, and then we kind of adapt to what we end up with. As you can tell, if you look closely at this video, uh, the ring unit on the left is tied down by bungee cords. The original concept was do some initial uh, characterization and they should be able to navigate with respect to each other using just the rings. Um, but it, they ran into some issues with the algorithm and we pulled what we, resources we had on the space station, uh, tied one down on the left and uh, restricted that uh, freedom uh, of the left unit and allowed the other unit to uh, control itself with respect to the other one. Um, so uh, just another way where we've had to come up with some creative solutions to get research done on, on space station, uh, even repairing the spheres unit. Um, when they break over 10 years, they, they do break. Um, and we've had to bring them down, repair it, and very quickly put it back in operation on, on the space station. Um, Vertigo was uh, an investigation where MIT is looking at vision-based navigation using stereoscopic vision. Much like the eyes, our eyes can sense distance uh, with the things around us because we have two eyes that have a, a fixed distance from each other. And uh, stereoscopic vision is trying to do the same thing here where it's like trying to identify um, uh, an unknown target, right? You're approaching a, a, uh, an asteroid or a, a, um, uh, a dead satellite and you want to identify not only uh, where it is and where I am, but also its mass and its inertia so you know how to circumnavigate around it uh, or approach it to uh, deorbit it, de -orbit it um, or anything you want, might want to do. So this is an investigation looking at that uh, where they were able to attach those goggles onto spheres and uh, navigate around uh, another sphere's unit. Um, again, one of the big reasons for sphere success is its extensibility, right? It's got an expansion port, we add new hardware, it's very modular, allows us to expand its capabilities over time. Halo, another MIT-led uh, effort where they're adding additional expansion ports onto spheres. One wasn't enough. They're now looking at in-space servicing, in-space construction, uh, automated docking, where you've got not just two, three, uh, but even more units trying to uh, operate together. And how do you dock them with each other? How do you uh, navigate with respect to each other? So they're, they're adding more expansion ports on there to support things like uh, these rigid docking ports, right? How do you dock with each other um, and rigidly attach to each other in multiple locations uh, to form uh, bigger spacecraft in space, right? That's a lot of what we're going to need to do if we go to Mars or other deep space des uh, um, designations destinations uh, is try to do assembly in space. And that's a lot of the technology they're looking at advancing with, uh, with spheres here. Slosh, this is a particular favorite of mine where they're looking at the uh, performance of fluid uh, in space and more specifically fuel in an upper stage rocket, right? We have software, we have CFD algorithms that can predict the kind of forces an upper stage rocket might see in microgravity. But believe it or not, those have never been validated, right? Even with aeronautics and wind tunnels, you test out that kind of stuff that validates your codes. Uh, but with uh, fuel in upper stage rockets and microgravity, that's a very difficult thing to do anywhere on Earth, right? We've got this pesky gravity vector going on around here. So uh, inside the space station, it's a, a great environment for testing out this type of thing where basically a, a, a pill-shaped tank of dye-colored uh, water uh, can be sloshed around and HD cameras on both sides can take video of its movement in response to controlled uh, movement from the spheres, right? You have two spheres rigidly attached to this pill on two sides um, and it'll move it in, in known ways. There's an IMU on there measuring the exact forces being applied and then with HD cameras you're taking video of the fluid movement and is it moving as you expect, as your software predicts it to operate in. And, um, as I'll get to later, a lot of the results from this um, went directly and supported the efforts by all the major launch providers. They were very interested in the results of this, and uh, the crew certainly got, uh, um, a, had a lot of fun with this. Uh, you, you may have seen other videos where crews doing experiments using water, coffee, all these different really cool things you can do in microgravity. Well, with these things, you have a, a nice uh, uh, controlled experiment where you can see how fluid moves inside of a tank and you end up getting some really cool behavior. Here you're seeing little uh, bubbles form that uh, orbit each other and fly around inside the tank, 
but they're resistant to becoming part of the bigger blob, right? In, in microgravity, the surface tension of water is a lot greater and counts for a lot more of its uh, motion, which is why it's, it's so different than how it operates uh, here on the ground. I think there's a little more to this where he brings this a little closer to the camera. And yeah, I've, I've spent a long time looking at these. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, uh, they're so much fun. And especially the crew, you, you can tell they're, um, uh, this other crew member in particular was just laughing the whole time because he, uh, he had fun with these. Uh, and again, this, this was not originally intended. Uh, the platform you saw earlier was what uh, this big uh, plastic thing that was holding the cameras between the two spheres units. And as they discovered, the crew member moving it around yielded a lot better science. And then here was yet another addition where they're duct taping these things together and seeing what they can do with these tanks all by themselves. So just getting more bang for the buck using uh, hardware we've already sent up there. And yet another investigation is uh, now being uh, conducted uh, later this year where they've attached um, this, these pills to uh, spheres using tethers. There was another investigation tethering two uh, spheres together um, and looking at the tethered dynamics, right? How do you deorbit uh, space junk in space? Uh, there's companies looking at exactly how to do that. So they're looking at, you tether two objects, what kind of dynamics can you expect? Can you tug one down out of, out of space? And, um, and so that investigation was conducted, really good stuff from that. And then at the end of that, uh, uh, we get together every quarter and, and users of Spheres and Astrobe, and we came up with this idea of putting uh, the tether investigation together with Spheres. This hardware already on station. All the hard work's already done. It turns out they worked really well together, together with um, uh, Airbus uh, actually led that investigation. And, um, and again, we hope to get some more uh, interesting video later this year of tethered uh, slosh tanks moving around space station. So uh, some other really cool uh, research. Now we get into a little bit of what uh, a previous talk given here uh, talked about with smart <coughs> spheres. Um, where they basically attached an Android-powered smartphone uh, onto uh, spheres to look at more robotic-type applications of uh, spheres, right? Spheres was initially designed to be more of a satellite, but with, a, with a, a smartphone, with all the capabilities that it has, a camera processing, uh, order of magnitude better than what was in spheres, right? Ten years ago, the state of the art was this TI DSP that the, ends up running the, its operating system. With this uh, smartphone, they were able to do a lot more with that and stream and teleoperate it from the ground. Um, and in fact, I think I'm going to get to some video here that describes that in more detail. Five, all three engines up and burning. Two, one, zero, and liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. What we're working towards is a future in which we can have robots that will take over a lot of the menial tasks that astronauts do. Our first goal for our project is to have ground controllers driving the sphere around on the space station. The sphere will take data and pictures and sensor readings and send that back to the user. She hooks it to the front and at that point the phone will be able to tell the sphere where it needs to go. The processor, the camera, and all of the sensors that are in the Nexus S become the brains of the robot and tell the, the sphere where it wants to fly. The Wi-Fi on the phone connects to the station Wi-Fi. That gets linked down to the ground, and then hopefully we're going to be able to control it from the ground. We chose the Nexus S because the phone is very easy to take apart. Android is easy to program. We're familiar with it, and we needed to make a lot of customizations that are easier to make with Android. Google was also working on an open source data logger, and it met our use case requirements. You can download this application for your Android device, and that is the exact same application as what NASA is using. The more time that the astronauts can spend doing science, uh, the more value we're getting out of that investment. Our goal is to provide enough value to crew, and enough value to operations, that they'll be able to keep it up there for a long time. Houston. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Android in space. Gotta love it. Um, so Smart Spheres 2 went on to do uh, better smartphones and in fact utilized a uh, advanced uh, Project Tango smartphone that got attached onto Spheres, which did even better uh, sensing and 3D imaging of its environment. 
Um, and that was a really cool investigation where for the first time, Spheres was operated outside its comfort zone. Spheres navigated a space station using a combination of ultrasound and infrared in a very fixed two meter by two meter volume inside one of the modules of the space station. And that's how it knows where it is and where it's going. With that, ca with that uh, Project Tango smartphone attached to it, it was able to generate 3D maps of its environment and then venture outside its comfort zone and uh, navigate using just the camera. So very exciting research being done there. And a lot of the same technology developed on uh, this platform went on to be used in uh, Android or um, Astro B. So why look at free flyers? Uh, I think I've covered uh, a lot of the foundational research being done using free flyers like Slosh, rings, all these things advancing our knowledge of uh, how things operate in space. And uh, again, benefits uh, pay off uh, uh, even in the short term with some of the launch providers that have all uh, utilized some of the results from that uh, investigation. But then um, uh, that just pays dividends down the road. And then of course, as a robotic platform, how can we support crew members in a spacecraft to uh, do more things in an automated way and not have to uh, use crew to do all the uh, maintenance on space station, right? Um, these are just some numbers looking at how much time can be saved where crew can spend more of their time doing the important research and less of their time maintaining the spacecraft. Uh, and certainly very important if we're going to start looking at deep space applications where um, it's important that uh, spacecraft be a lot more automated uh, and not as uh, complicated to operate, frankly, because there's only so many crew members uh, that are going to be on a, on a deep space uh, spacecraft and, and a long communication delay from, from Earth. So now I get into Astro B, some of the really exciting stuff we're working on today. Uh, just an overview. There will be three Astro Bs on the space station. And I'll get to some videos showing uh, some demos of them in operation in our lab. Um, uh, to be operated in 2008, we're going to launch it hopefully uh, by summer next year, uh, commissioned and installed on space station and then fully operational by late 2018. Um, where it's then available for guest research and for all kinds of people to use it as a robotic platform on, on space station. Uh, six total cameras. Uh, unlike spheres, Astro B will be entirely vision-based navigation um, to operate anywhere in, in the USOS section of ISS. So that's basically anywhere but the Japanese uh, or uh, Russian segment of, of space station. So that really opens up what it can do on the space station and supporting uh, what it can do. One of its big goals being, uh, again, replacing spheres as a research platform on space station, but also serving as a mobile camera platform. Because it has a lot of really great cameras on it, it can automate the camera views and uh, a lot of the mobile camera tasks that astronauts actually have to do every time they reposition cameras that, where ground control can get good views of what's going on on space station, as well as being a uh, mobile sensor platform. With this little free-flying robot, we can now take measurements all across ISS, uh, measurements like CO2, radiation, all kinds of things, uh, audio type sensing. These are things crews spend a good amount of time going around space station taking measurements and something that uh, a robot can do instead. Uh, uh, one comparison I like to make is, is uh, Astro B is a lot like the uh, Roomba of the space station. Right? We have little robots that can automate a lot of these menial tasks. Um, uh, and Astro B can do that on, on the space station. Some of the design drivers uh, designed to be uh, multifunctional in a, a lot of different scenarios. Um, general navigation across space station, docking, perching, uh, conducting guest science, um, carry uh, platform. Something we learned from spheres was uh, it's important to be modular, extensible, uh, and new things can get it add, added onto it. Current uh, robot design, um, 12 roughly 12 by 12 by 12 inches, 12.5 inches uh, cubed, uh, targeting 10 kilograms. This actually is a little outdated. Uh, 10 kilograms in mass is the target uh, for its uh, size and mass. And here are different um, aspects of Astro B. Uh, unlike spheres, uh, it moves around using a blower. So spheres use compress CO2. Astro B is using a blower to suck in air during, uh, in its sides. and um, uh, expel the air out different vents. You can see different vents on different sides of uh, Astro B where it lets out uh, the air. The uh, two uh, boxes on both sides that sandwich Astro B uh, pressure up to about 0.1 PSI and uh, generate the force that way. Where the flaps on the, um, uh, uh, on the sides there open up and allow variable 
thrust uh, and in any given direction, which is what really gives it its hol holonomic uh, motion. It does have a perching arm, which allows it to perch onto handrails inside a space station and really gives it its pan and tilt functionality for its camera. So we can then, in a very automated way, uh, uh, perch anywhere on space station and get great angles and visibility into what's going on in uh, space station. Uh, basic pa packaging uh, looks uh, like this. Uh, the coloring is going to be a bit different. Um, we're, st we're now working on the um, actual flight units that will end up flying next year. And these are a lot of renderings and basic concepts uh, showing where the battery is going, turn signals. With something that moves around in, in a full holonomic motion, how do you convey to crew where it's going, what it's doing? With cars, we're used to turn signals that go left or right, but in something that can go up, down, left, right, forward, aft, you know, how do you communicate these intentions to crew? So this is a whole area of uh, research where uh, people are looking at human-robot uh, interaction and how do you communicate these things to each other? How do you optimize that relationship of crew and robots working together to um, achieve greater things? Some of the indicators, it will have a touch screen on the front uh, together with a speaker, a microphone, a laser pointer, uh, indicator lights, uh, a lot of different ele elements that make Astro be a lot more interactive and certainly a lot more robotic in nature. So it can interact with crew and uh, be a true uh, assistant on, on the space station. Propulsion, I mentioned, it uses this impeller um, that, uh, as it turned out, was a more efficient means of propulsion inside the space station. Um, not so great for outside the space station, though. <laughs> um, some of the nozzles uh, and their location. There is a preferred direction. Uh, you can tell the nozzles on the front and back are a little bit bigger, and then you've got more of them uh, in that direction. So you can get bigger uh, forces and motions in forward or aft, um, as well as better sensing. You, we have some uh, different cameras uh, that um, There you go, some uh, video of a concept of how the uh, turn signals are going to operate uh, uh, on the uh, Astro B. Computing, uh, it, unlike spheres, it's going to have three uh, cell phone class processors, ARM architecture processors capable of doing a lot of computing, uh, a mid, uh, high level, mid level, and low level processor um, that uh, will do all the computing. The low level processor doing a lot of the low level control a lot of the GNC work of navigation, the mid-level processor uh, doing a lot of the uh, vision-based navigation, processing of camera video, um, and then the high-level processor dedicated almost entirely to guest science research. And it's that high-level processor that's uh, running an Android operating system where guest scientists can uh, design apps, basically, that get uh, uplinked to Space Station and can operate Astro B uh, in any custom way they, they like. Uh, power systems, uh, it does recharge. It does have a docking station. Um, power system, 14 volt batteries, four of them, that gives it uh, roughly two to four hour operating time inside the space station. Uh, avionics stack, a lot of these things, uh, as we've learned, have been designed to be modular and replaceable, right? Things break, things get upgraded. Uh, we're close to launching these on space station and the avionics are already outdated, right? So uh, there'll come a time when we'll want to update a lot of the avionics uh, and uh, hardware. I mentioned a lot of the cameras. Uh, there are cameras pointed forward and aft. Uh, Hascam, perching cam are 3D imaging sensors, very similar to Kinect or some of the uh, previous smartphone cameras that can give you 3D mapping uh, maps of your environment. And those are used for perching onto handrails as well as docking onto the uh, docking station. Um, Sidecam, HD camera for visualizing things on the ground. That gets, does get streamed to a uh, ground uh, GUI. External sensors. Uh, that gives it the IMU, the speed cam. Uh, these actually are all the cameras and their capabilities. As I mentioned, flight software. Um, the, uh, the architecture is largely based on ROS, the robot operating system. It's an open source uh, software platform for doing this kind of uh, robotics research and uh, certainly widely used in, in academia for, for robotics. And it's what ties together a lot of the flight software that operates on, on Astro B. As I mentioned, uh, all three processors uh, are running uh, the mid-level and uh, low-level running Linux, uh, high-level running Android, um, low-level control loop operating at 100 hertz uh, in, in tune with the IMU and a lot of the high-rate information. Um, 
system data flow diagram talking about the way the uh, different processors inside the uh, Asterby communicate with each other over an internal network. Um, and then together with the other three units, uh, I will highlight the names as, as the project is uh, called Honeybee. The unique names for each unit have been picked out to be uh, Queen Bee, uh, Honeybee, and Bumblebee. Uh, so riffing on that uh, whole theme there. Um, and then we've got a whole other set of uh, interesting names for the ground units as well, and I can get uh, into that if you ask. Um, so here it's also showing communication uh, with ground control stations, uh, both at uh, JSC, where they have the Mission Control Center, as well as Marshall, where they do a lot of the payload commanding, um, and then our Mission Operations Center here at NASA Ames. Uh, and then in addition to that, we can operate ground control stations at guest science uh, facilities. So whether that's at a university, a school, uh, your garage, we can operate Astrobe from a lot of different unique locations, um, really enabling some rapid um, design and testing on space station. Uh, again, covering a lot of the communication over uh, the uh, networking interfaces on space station, the perching arm, two degrees of freedom there um, that allows it to pan and tilt uh, uh, its view on uh, space station. Uh, more renderings of the perching arm. I'm going to go ahead and skip through a lot of these. Uh, payload layout, uh, again, very extensible. We've got three uh, what we refer to as 1U uh, payload bays where external hardware can be attached onto spheres and expand its capability. So you want to put special sensors, better cameras, better, better audio equipment. That can be done using its expansion ports as well as its mechanical uh, loading bays there uh, where you can even utilize more than one for one unit if you, had, if you needed more space uh, to do that does have a docking station where it can uh, go back, just like a Roomba, go back, recharge, uh, and then go back out and carry on op operations. Uh, that's where it can uh, recharge, communicate uh, over a hard link down to the ground. Um, uh, you can see uh, little uh, AR tags on, on the uh, uh, docking station there. One thing I didn't touch on was uh, the different approaches to vision-based navigation. One is a, a general sparse mapping where it's looking at different features it sees across ISS, mapping that against a, a known map, uh, a priori, where it matches up different features, and that gives it uh, decent navigation across ISS. When it comes to docking onto the docking station, however, it uses a different approach, utilizing AR tags, which gives it the better accuracy uh, of being able to calculate its pose and its position with respect to uh, those AR tags on the, on the uh, dock. And in fact, we have concepts of being able to put those AR tags in different parts of space station where I guess scientists might want that uh, centimeter level accuracy of knowing where the astrobe is um, and different research that calls for that. Uh, and then the, yet another third approach to the vision navigation is those uh, 3D uh, hazard cameras that can do, generate 3D maps of its environment um, and do the uh, uh, docking onto the uh, dock as well as the uh, uh, handrails when it comes to perching. Uh, control station, a uh, GUI is being designed that can operate uh, not just at the uh, Mission Control Center but also at our uh, mission Operations Center um, that uh, gives users access to Astro Beyond Space Station. And one of the key features is being able to vary the level of autonomy, right? We can do anything from RC control these things on Space Station, even with the delay involved with communication to the Space Station, or in a completely automated way, kick off uh, plans and different things uh, uh, where they're operating all by themselves on, on Space Station. So we can vary that uh, level of autonomy uh, from beginning to end. A uh, quick little video of Astrobe operating in our lab. What you're seeing here is actually our granite table uh, where we can do this kind of testing in our lab uh, where Astrobe can move around in an almost friction-free environment, very similar to how it operates on, up on uh, Space Station. Um, and uh, like I was talking about earlier with our gantry uh, microgravity test facility, uh, we have the world's greatest uh, crane game. Well, here we have the world's greatest air hockey table. If you guys have played air hockey at, at the uh, arcades, basic, same basic concept. We have an air carriage with compressed CO2 that forms a cushion of air between that air carriage and this very flat, very smooth uh, granite table uh, that's less than a paper's width difference from corner to corner that allows us bias-free motion across the table uh, just like it would experience up on a space station. And so what you're seeing here is Astrobe uh, using its vision-based navigation to navigate uh, across this volume um, using its uh, cameras. You see the camera from uh, the uh, top uh, ceiling uh, giving us an outside observation of where it is in, in the volume so that we can better characterize its uh, built-in uh, navigation. 
there you see uh, camera views uh, from uh, on board and uh, what it's seeing. I think it's doing a basic eight uh, maneuver there. And, and one thing you're not hearing on this video is the flapping and the whirring of its motors. And that was actually a big challenge in designing a free flyer that operates using a blower is keeping its noise level down. As you can imagine, operating on the space station could get kind of noisy, and you don't want to be living and working in a place that sounds like a factory all day, uh, every day. So uh, they do keep strict limits on uh, the amount of noise you can generate on, on space station. And so uh, we, uh, from the get-go, uh, looked at um, designing the blowers to operate at certain speeds, and then the uh, flaps not to generate uh, undue amounts of uh, noise. Um, but certainly a challenge uh, with this type of propulsion. And here you can see it uh, executing a docking uh, maneuver uh, using those uh, AR tags I was referring to earlier. I'm going to speed this up a little bit, get to another section. Ah, I, I talked about the microgravity test facility, the, the world's greatest crane game. This is it. <laughs> so we have this gantry moving around, just like you saw earlier with the uh, PSA free flower. We've revamped that facility to be able to test out the uh, Astrobe avionics unit. And this is very important for testing out that vision-based navigation on the ground, right, where we can have a camera in the loop um, when uh, navigating across a uh, environment that's visually similar to a uh, space station. Uh, we do have a simulator that's uh, now released in open source that has uh, a lot of the uh, flight software involved, but uh, it's hard to replace doing a lot of hardware in the loop, uh, in particular with the camera uh, in a full six degree of freedom motion uh, across the uh, volume there. How do you use Astrobe? So it's not limited to NASA, government agencies, it's available to you guys as, as tax-paying citizens. Uh, you have access to this facility on the space station. And if you have interesting research, uh, uh, please let me know. Uh, we're open to uh, new research. So there is an API being designed that would allow that uh, guest science to operate on the high-level processor as well as anywhere in the Astrobe. And none of the software being designed on Astrobe um, is uh, deemed safety critical, which allows us to very quickly iterate on the software on, on Astrobe. So we can come up with new ideas, updates, push them up to the uh, hardware on space station uh, with, in very little amount of time with, um, uh, because it's not safety critical, right? We can iterate, we can afford to uh, fail, we can afford to have mistakes uh, uh, occasionally. And so this describes some of the API features. Uh, the simulator now released on GitHub, I, would, I encourage you guys to check it out. Um, being a, a facility open to uh, researchers, uh, we're trying to release as much documentation and uh, software as possible for uh, other people to take advantage of it. Here's some architecture talking about what the simulator does, um, simulating a lot of the flight software stack built into the Astrobe unit, uh, and then this shows it talking to uh, the ground control station. Uh, here's some video of it in operation together with Gazebo, the 3D uh, animation. Um, this video unfortunately isn't too detailed. You can kind of see uh, the uh, code and then a uh, Android emulator operating, where it's operating the, uh, uh, a very Hello World type uh, app, communicating to the rest of the uh, flight software on Astrobe, and then communicating motion commands to the Astrobe unit. And in a moment, if I speed it up a little bit, you'll see its motion there on the bottom. It's a little hard to see, but there it is traversing uh, the 3D environment there. Uh, as I said, we have a guest scientist program. Uh, we have a lot of experience from Spheres in supporting people using this facility on space station, so fast-tracking the process um, and navigating the ISS payload uh, process of getting real research done on, on space station. Uh, different uh, phases of that kind of uh, guest scientist program. Uh, I invite you guys to check it out later on. Uh, just some overview of the different uh, testing facilities we have at NASA Ames. We've covered the uh, granite table, the uh, MGTF, the flight lab where we build flight hardware, environmental testing, and then of course our mission operations center, which is basically a, 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 a nice computer lab where we uh, uh, interact with the astronauts during the test session on, on the space station. So that's a really cool part of uh, uh, this facility. We get to interact with the astronauts. 
on the space station. So what are we doing in the future? We're already looking at uh, a lot of interested users wanting to use Astro Beyond Space Station to do some really cool research. Uh, there's a group at JSC looking at RFID logistics tracking. Uh, you can think of ISS as a five bedroom house where the family changes out every six months, right? Uh, I certainly lose stuff in my house. It's, uh, they do lose things on space station. So logistics tracking, tracking of different things on space station is a very important thing, something they spend a lot of time on doing. If Astrobe can be designed with a RFID tracker along with tagging of different objects on space station, that can be a big help in that regard. Deep audio analytics, we're working with uh, Bosch and Astrobotic uh, at looking at custom Bosch um, uh, audio uh, sensing that can try to characterize the audio environment and then perhaps even uh, diagnose and identify off-nominal conditions on the space station. Uh, very useful for uh, continued operation of, of space station, but certainly an area of research and something um, uh, they're very interested in. Uh, CO2 monitors, as I referred to earlier, there's people at JSC looking at uh, uh, crew radiation exposure, uh, CO2, uh, 3D camera payloads, people want to do 360 vision, all kinds of really cool research there. Different companies looking at uh, not just RFID sensors, but RFID applicators. How do you go around uh, uh, tagging different things on space station? Uh, advanced uh, manipulators, gimbals, arms. How can we build a free flyer that's more interactive and more uh, manipulative uh, on its environment, right? How can you get them to dock or uh, manipulate different things on, on space station and do, and do some real active work uh, with advanced docking interfaces? Uh, there's some uh, researchers looking at gecko-inspired uh, appendages that can attach onto different things, move things around, um, and affect things uh, in a microgravity environment. Uh, just some other areas of research that people are looking at. Formation flight, again, advancing uh, the state of the art in that area, robotic manipulation, human-robot interaction, things I've touched on uh, in the past. And so let, let me first uh, preface this next video. As I uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, STEM outreach is a big part of uh, what we do as well, and uh, right now the, the, the greatest game in town is called Zero Robotics, led by MIT, first operated on, the, on spheres. Uh, this is a program, well actually let me just jump to the video because it does a lot better job uh, explaining this than, than I do. A real engineer doesn't answer why not. A real engineer answers how. We're running these educational playgrounds where kids are getting an experience, even in middle school, of working in a team where they really care about what happens. This is an incredible competition. It gets teams all around the world involved programming satellites. We can have kids on the ground send their codes up to the space station and we can run contests on the space station. You don't have anybody else you can turn to except each other. Welcome to MIT uh, the auditorium is full. Four, three, two, one. We can have high school students write whatever software they want, and it's very risk tolerant. You don't say that normally with a space system. Once we have um, multiple versions of our code running, it's very important to, to know all the cases, um, what would work in each and every scenario. Um, I'm a sophomore in high school, so I'm 15 years old. Actually, my birthday was in December, so I just turned 15. When we go to Mars, one of the things we will want to do is set up a GPS system. So in this year's game, we had them deploy three satellites that would be able to triangulate, just like GPS triangulates. Once these spheres were in space, the only thing going up and down is the software. Let's go ahead for the run. Okay. In the game, they have to position the GPS system and then grab the things and bring them to an assembly area so that they could actually be controlled. In our strategy is that we utilize our quick movement speed to get an early lead and we spend the rest of the game guarding our zone or blocking the other team from putting items in their zone to keep our lead and hopefully win the game. They've been crashing into their items that they're supposed to pick up. So once they crash, the items move around. The large items, which return the most points, that's the first thing that we search for. 
We see Orange defending his space and running out of allocated fuel. No, no. You've never had this no, cause, grand cause, cause it's not like one particular thing went wrong. Basically, the thing stopped working. It did seem to give him some challenges. I addressed all of that with my code, so I, I'm not sure what happened to it. We got the final score, blue 181 and orange 232. The greatest part was working with different teams from around the world. I'm from Mexico. Soy mexicano y nos está representando de esta forma, diga programación, robot, diga. You got through language barriers, you got through cultural barriers, and you work together to get here. And that is such an amazing accomplishment and such an example for our world. C'était une super opportunité de pouvoir travailler donc avec le MIT, la NASA. These are the kids that are going to rock the future. All right, so uh, that's Zero Robotics operated twice a year in the summer with middle school students and uh, in the fall winter time with uh, high school students. Really great program. Um, check it out. Uh, these are our links. Uh, more information about Spheres and Asprey can be found here. Um, and uh, I'm open to questions. Um, had a question about the uh, propulsion system. So Spheres had CO2 propulsion. Mm -hmm. Astra B has uh, compre well, slightly compressed air Those propulsion propellers. and propellers. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, Astra B can't be used outside uh, in the space environment where Spheres can, mm -hmm. which gives it some interesting things. Now, Mars is an environment which sort of is a compromise between them, right? It's low G and it's mm -hmm. very low atmospheric pressure. Has there been any thinking about uh, the applicability of, of, of an astro like platform or spheres on Mars? Mars 2020, I understand, is going to have a drone get mm -hmm. deployed. Um, mm -hmm. It would be even more cool to deploy a, a spheres or, or an astro type of uh, platform. Absolutely. Um, quick correction, spheres can actually operate outside, but you're right, the uh, compressed CO2 uh, gives you that thruster-like uh, behavior that's and, and very similar to what you would see in a dedicated satellite, right? That would, that could operate EVA. Uh, but spheres, as, as they are, don't actually operate outside, um, and they'd actually have some issues operating outside. Okay, because there was that clip with it uh, in the open bay door of of the um, uh, Atlantis. Was, wasn't that out? That was AirCam. Oh, that, that was AirCam. That was a project out of JSC where. Uh, they did operate a very similar type uh, free flyer outside of the space shuttle in, in yeah. 97. Um, so different project, but certainly a, a similar approach. I think they used uh, uh, a different type of cold gas for propulsion, mm -hmm. uh, but that wasn't quite spheres. Uh, but you're right, with the blower, it's very much limited to IVA type uh, uh, motion. And, um, and so with uh, these IVA type free flyers, a lot of the future uh, work as far as robotics is concerned is looking at continued IVA type uh, behavior. So whether that's ISS, uh, a deep space gateway, or other deep, sp deep space spacecraft, where we need these kind of robots to enhance what we can do inside of spacecraft and maintain the spacecraft for long duration uh, space travel. Um, and that said, there are some technologies that can be advanced here that uh, benefit uh, EVA type free flyers. So the navigation, the, um, uh, uh, the algorithms, the vision-based navigation. Uh, are just some of the technologies that do have some transfer uh, into uh, other areas uh, that could power EVA. And then even these types of drones that could operate on Mars. Uh, some of the um, technology that some of these landers use to narrow and find where they're going to land on, on, on Mars or another planet um, are, have very similar algorithms to what operate inside of uh, Astro B. Uh, doing a lot of these advanced common filter type algorithms that can do these sensor fusions and very quickly, very rapidly fuse together IMUs, vision, uh, uh, satellite information, any information it can um, to uh, get accurate and better uh, results uh, as far as navigation goes. Uh, you said that uh, all these peers are supposed to be operating in either autonomous mode or RC mode. So how autonomous is the autonomous mode? Like, do you specify just point A to point B, and then it goes from point A to point B? Or do we have to give the route from, for it to go from point A to point B? It depends on the researcher. It depends on what you're trying to uh, do on space station. So Spheres has had all kinds of algorithms tested out where they have been RC controlled by crew, by ground controllers, 
but they've also had algorithms on there that does intelligent path planning, right? How do you, how do you uh, in real time, uh, learn what kind of obstacles are in front of you and plan out what your trajectory and what, what your path is going to be? Uh, there's this one really cool uh, video of spheres in operation. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can check this out, where you have two spheres orbiting each other um, uh, in, in a perfect um, uh, uh, formation, right? They're, they're across from each other. And then you have this third, third spheres unit looking like it wants to jump in on, on the hopscotch, right? And then, uh, and then it jumps in, and then now you have three spheres in orbit around each other, perfectly equal distance from each other. And that's showing how you can do real-time planning of your trajectory uh, and motion uh, using completely automated built-in um, algorithms uh, without any control from the outside. So uh, advancing some of the algorithms needed to do that. And then even more intelligent type uh, automation algorithms that uh, try to do a lot of diagnostics, a lot of um, identifying uh, the environment, giving crew uh, advance warning on different things, uh, just trying to be a, a, a good citizen as far as uh, being a, a little robot on, on space station. So, and then giving, giving a face to a smart environment. That's another big area of research is trying to generate these uh, smart habitats where uh, you're trying to get a lot of information from not just uh, the uh, environment and built-in sensors, but also sensors on this free flyer, and then interact with crew, right? So uh, you can generate an environment that's very intelligent and uh, can do a lot of things without uh, hands-on uh, maintenance. Uh, the uh, propulsion of uh, spheres is compressed CO2. Uh, does ISS have the ability to co um, create and compress and recharge, or does it have to, those canisters, or do they have to come up from the ground? Uh, so the ability to recycle CO2 into a way that's then compressed and reusable is actually an area of research. I know there are uh, researchers looking at doing exactly that. It's not a routine thing, at least not yet, on, on Space Station. Um, not something Spheres utilizes. Uh, with Spheres, uh, over the last 10 years, my team's gotten pretty good at uh, refilling these CO2 tanks, as it turns out. There's a, a certain set of tanks we use uh, that are uh, safety rated. And then uh, they get brought back from Space Station, uh, refilled here at our facility, and we relaunch them every time. So it's actually a consumable resource um, that uh, gets used up. We'll go through maybe two or three uh, tanks during a test session. To, uh, um, and uh, so it's a consumable. Uh, and uh, the amount of CO2 expelled, as it turns out, uh, isn't uh, too harmful to, to crew. It, it's, it's well within limits of what can get scrubbed out of, of the environment. So it turned out to be a, a really great uh, propulsion uh, for spheres. And, uh, but yeah, I have heard there are other researchers looking at recycling and pulling the CO2 from uh, the environment back into a way that's then reusable. Um, certainly in situ uh, resource utilization is a very big area that we're going to need to uh, make advances in uh, to go to Mars and other deep space uh, uh, destinations. Thank you all.